Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate uh, the witnesses, and I really appreciate you all having this hearing today. Um, uh, Dr. Curry, I I'm curious if you could talk about uh, some of y'all's recommendations related to disastersassistance.gov. I know you, you talked about this a little bit. Um, we had numerous instances where we had folks that had applied for disasterassistance.gov. They were just denied, weren't given any reason. The reality is it wasn't a final denial. It was a lack of information or incomplete applications. There was not a process for these people to go back and amend applications. Has, has GAO made recommendations in terms of the, the user friendliness or just applicability of, of, uh, of, of disasterassistance.gov? Yes, sir, we have. We, we dove into the individual assistance process and the .gov interface to it, as you mentioned, and we found a number of challenges with usability in that process. You, you mentioned one of them. One of them was just how they communicate with the survivor through a letter um, that often says denied or ineligible, uh, but that doesn't mean a denial. could just mean, for example, that the person's insurance needs to pay first or they need to provide more documents. But the, the effect of that's sort of chilling because, you know, if you get a letter from the federal government that says denied, you're, you're going to think denied. Um, you're not going to continue the process. And that's what we found is that people that could have been eligible uh, maybe didn't even get the amount they would be eligible for or didn't continue the process. And that's just one of many things. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate it. And then uh, something else I wanted to bring up, and I know the chair mentioned this earlier, and I know that Congressman Carter um, – is uh, is also interested in it. That's right. I just called you out. You saw that, Troy. Um, and so, uh, but but we we've got this issue. Congressman Carter and I both have been dealing with constituents that uh, have been just tremendously impacted from Hurricane Ida last year. And and you've got the the immediate um, assistance that may be available from SBA or FEMA. And then you've got you got HUD that comes in later on. I mean, look, we we worked really hard to get um, funds included in the in the uh, CR back in September. Uh, for the 2021 disasters, HUD hadn't even allocated the funds yet. And as you know, allocation yeah. simply means you're going to get this much uh, to the state, which then the states have to go through, do action plans, apply. So here we are, appropriated money in September. It's now February, and they haven't even allocated the funds. After they do, uh, after they make the allocation, we're probably looking at, um, and I'm probably being generous, about nine months for, before the state can actually start cutting checks. I mean, so, so these are meanwhile disaster victims. So can you just speak to kind of the handoff with the different agencies, whether it be SBA who starts or FEMA, depending on the loan or, or grant situation, and then HUD, and if y'all have made recommendations about just stopping the federal government from continuing to victimize these people that are victims? Yes, sir, definitely. And there's no better state than Louisiana to understand uh, all the federal programs over the last you few years. You could have stopped um, in Louisiana. You could have stopped in yeah. Louisiana. No, no. <laughs> Um, it's um, so yes, we we pointed this out. So th there's multiple levels of problems. I mean, there's there's problems within FEMA and its own programs and the timeframes and the different regulations. But then there's problems of, across the department. So I think what's key to understand is these programs were never designed to work together. Um, they were all created separately. There were sep there's separate regulations. They have separate timeframes. They have separate execution. They have separate documentation requirements not designed to work together, but they're used together in disasters routinely now. It used to be they weren't, now they are. And so that's the problem that, that has to get addressed. But on the, on the HUD issue, just one example, um, you know, it, it's been bad in Louisiana, but, but it, let, I'll give you an example of Puerto Rico. Those, those funds, you know, they haven't even really started to be spent yet from five years ago. Um, it's taken that long to get a HUD uh, rule and plan together and start executing the funding. So what we hear from states and locals is how are we supposed to plan recovery projects, let alone invest in mitigation projects where even more complicated if we have no idea when we're going to get the money or if we're going to be able to use it together. So I'm going to show you this. This is our Restore Louisiana website. Um, we appropriated $1.6 billion, uh, $1.7 billion in uh, late 2016 and early 2017. Here we are over five years later, and this is how much they've made available to homeowners. $666 million out of $1.7 billion. Five years later. I mean, this performance is, is inexplicable. And Madam Chair, I want to thank you. I know you had worked with us on the, on the bill we did with Congresswoman Stacey Plaskett, uh, trying to help uh, put this all under FEMA's 
uh, roof. So, so that way, you know, you have one agency that's out there doing more of the, 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 the immediate and the long term and giving states a larger role. Uh, I know Mr. Rouser has a bill as well, and I just want to re-urge that we continue looking at this. I, I think it's a really important issue that we have seamless handoff and have our government stop re-victimizing uh, some of these survivors or flood victims. And I apologize, the other two witnesses, we're going to be submitting questions for the record for you, but thank you for your participation. Yield back. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and Ranking Member. Uh, I stand in concert with, with my colleague from Louisiana, um, my dear friend, Mr. Graves. You know, we oftentimes in the immediate aftermath of Katrina found ourselves tag teaming, um, fighting for Louisiana residents, asking, um, you know, what we thought and what we agree, and, and, and even later everyone agrees, were just very basic, simple questions of um, why so much red tape? Why insult to injury? Um, why adding more red tape and more difficulty to it's already a very difficult time for people? Um, as Garrett mentioned many times, it was applications that were not um, completely filled out or maybe a box that was not checked properly. And there was no appeal process to come back and fix it without us painstakingly getting involved and really getting people back to the table. Well, the fact of the matter is people who already been hurt by a storm uh, should not have added insult by having a bureaucracy that swallows them up. So I've got a, a, a question. What, what, can, what steps can be done to help FEMA be uh, more user-friendly? Uh, to take out some of the red tape and minimize some of the changing policies. We know our state and local governments are developing public policy projects, and we need to make sure that they dovetail and they work together and not cause further of a log jam. So can you share with me some thoughts on how FEMA could do a better job and how we might help them do a better job? Yes, sir, it's Chris Curry. Oh, oh. Sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll, I'll start quick so you have time. Um, so I think that, first of all, the, the mindset and the culture has to change that these programs are, need to be focused on service delivery and efficiency. And there was an executive order that the president issued in December uh, focusing on federal government programs and improving service delivery. FEMA's disaster programs is one of them. But you can't just talk about it. You've got to get in there and you've got to pick apart these programs, look at every part of the process, look at the barriers that are within them. I mean, we've pointed out many of them in our reports. And then you need to completely re-engineer them and retrain the staff so there's a cultural shift in how they're run. Um, you know, it's no different from how a business would, would want to shift its focus to customer service. Uh, that's what needs to be done program by program. And then across these departments, they, they need to look at how they can work together to streamline and harmonize these programs. It can be done with, with effective leadership. It's just got to be a priority. Sorry, let me interrupt you for a second. Are there plans to do that? Because very respectfully, we have storms that come every year. They come stronger, they come faster, they come bigger, they come harder. And this is not new to us. In these kind of battles that we've had with FEMA, other federal agencies, it, it seems like we're having the same conversations every time. Some of the things are so basic and so elementary that it really should not require rocket science to move yeah. them. So I, I hear you that there shouldn't be more talk, there should be more action. Can you share with me some ideas that we can help facilitate that will become action items in advance of the next series of natural disasters? Well, I, I think I think part of this is asking FEMA through oversight, through hearings like this, but also through you know requests for information or, or meetings or whatever, to ask for the, press them on specifics about what they're doing within these programs to break down some of these barriers. You know, it's great to implement some of these things in the strategic plan and, and talk at a high level about priorities, but, you know, that it, that takes a while to, to trickle its way down into the programs and into the people that run them. That This requires a cultural change. Um, you know, we have a number of recommendations on areas that they are working on. They, I think they do get it. They understand they need to, there's a lot of pressure on them. To I'm not just dumping on them. I'm not just dumping because I think they have heard us and they have tried and they've made adjustments as we brought that to their attention. But some of the adjustments are so elementary that one, they should, have need, should not have needed our intervention. But two, some of the changes appear to be partial and then they slip right back to the old way they were doing it. It needs to be memorialized in, in a policy change and not just, oh, the congressman called and therefore we fixed it. And real quickly before I go, because I, I, my time's going to be up, uh, I asked this question before and I'm going to double down on it. As cyber attacks increase, 
is the GAO studying the potential for cyber attacks during um, a, a natural disaster? Uh, and if not, is there something that's going to be done that you're going to look into that? Because that's one step away from something that we can find ourselves in a very devastating position in the middle of a natural disaster and some terrorist group decides to take advantage of an otherwise strained system. Uh, have you given some thought to that? Are there some things going on that you can share with us? Thank you, sir. I, I'm not aware of any study or any evaluation we've done of cyber attacks specifically during a natural disaster. We've done work on cybersecurity across all the agencies that would be involved in a disaster, but I will take that back and talk to our cybersecurity experts and we can uh, I can get back to you on our plans for that or whether we need to work together to, to do that in the future. I, I would definitely do that. I suspect that it's something that we should be concerned about and suspect that there may be some work going on and if we can collaborate among agencies to make sure that we have the best um, practices in place to be prepared, I greatly appreciate it. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Ma Madam Thank Chair, you. If, you, if you don't, uh, just one one point on what Mr. Carter just brought up. We had thousands of constituents that essentially got hacked. Somebody else applied for their disaster assistance, and then our constituents that were real disaster victims were blocked out. He made a great point. 